The 2019 hurricane season was extremely slow to start as only three named systems occurred by August 24th. However, this allowed the waters of the Atlantic Basin to remain untapped and primed for a perfect storm. On August 24th, 2019, a tropical system would develop and by its end, it would cause apocalyptic damage and destroy the credibility of the National Hurricane Center. This hurricane was supposed to hit Hispaniola as a tropical storm or weak hurricane, but fate had other plans. This hurricane would undergo three rapid intensification cycles, leaving it virtually unchecked as it approached land. This hurricane would obliterate the Abaco Islands and Grand Bahama, with Freeport getting the eyewall of a Category 5 hurricane for 36 hours. This hurricane is Hurricane Dorian, the perfect storm. You might have heard of it, and if you were in the Bahamas, you might have witnessed it. I am Pat from Pat's Path Predictor, and welcome to the Hurricane Dorian documentary. This historic hurricane would cause absolute catastrophe. I can't even call it catastrophe. It caused apocalyptic damage to much of the Bahamas. In this documentary, we're going over everything from when it started to develop to its three, yes, three rapid intensification cycles to when it stalled over to the Bahamas, as well as the controversy that the NHC faced for one of its calls. What will become an apocalyptic nightmare for the NHC, as well as the Bahamas, started off as a tropical wave off the coast of Africa, and would gradually make its way towards the main development region, as well as the Lesser Antilles. By August 23rd, 2019, this wave had become increasingly consolidated, and convection improved to a level that would start to turn the cogs of this storm. On August 24th at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 1500 UTC, disturbance would become a tropical depression, Tropical Depression 5, 800 miles away from Barbados. This would ultimately strengthen into Tropical Storm Dorian six hours later, as it would continue to consolidate and show a 12 mile wide eye structure, which would allow it to strengthen further. Dorian's original strengthening was modest. It took a day to further organize and then strengthened into a 50 mile per hour tropical storm by 5 p.m. on August 25th. At this time, Dorian was expected to hit the Dominican Republic as a strong tropical storm, with some models having it as a Category 1 hurricane. Dorian would continue slowly to strengthen reaching 60 mile per hour winds on August 26th as it approached Barbados, with tropical storm warnings already issued for much of the Windward Islands. Dorian would then first make landfall on Barbados on August 26th at 8 p.m., bringing heavy rain to the island. It also made landfall in St. Lucia 10 hours later. However, due to Barbados and St. Lucia's geography, their mountainous terrain disrupted Dorian's core, and it weakened back down to a 50 mile per hour tropical storm. However, Dorian entered the Caribbean Sea and began to reorganize. By this point, the NHC was now expecting Dorian to make landfall in the Eastern Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico as a weak hurricane. However, everything changed on August 27th, 2019 at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Before this, Dorian was moving due west and was expected to enter a more unfavorable environment for further strengthening in the Eastern Caribbean Sea. However, at that particular time, Dorian's center of circulation relocated over 100 miles to the north, and that did two things. The first thing that it did was the trajectory of the track had changed. Instead of moving due west, it was now moving northwest towards the U.S. Virgin Islands in eastern Puerto Rico, much further east than expected. The second thing that happened was that Dorian now moved into much better conditions for not only strengthening, but rapid intensification, as it now was over thick, warm water and much weaker wind shear than expected in the Caribbean Sea. 
The air around the storm was somewhat dry, but due to Dorian's compact structure, it did absolutely nothing to the storm. This relocation was about to make Dorian a monster, like the Titans that came before it. Dorian would then undergo the first of three rapid intensification cycles as it approached the Virgin Islands. On August 28th, Dorian approached the U.S. Virgin Islands and started to bring tropical storm force winds to the area. At the same time, Dorian began to quickly strengthen. It would go from a 50 mile per hour tropical storm to an 85 mile per hour category 1 hurricane in 24 hours. Dorian first became a hurricane at the Virgin Islands as they were recording hurricane force winds with Dorian, with Buck Island just south of St. Thomas recording a sustained wind of 82 miles per hour and a gust of 111 miles per hour. An insanely high gust considering Dorian's apparent strength. These measurements were the exact reason why Dorian was designated at the intensity it was. On top of that, the structure of Dorian saw more organization as it made landfall at St. Croix and then St. Thomas at Category 1 Hurricane status. However, shortly after leaving the Virgin Islands, dry air began to invade Dorian's core, which halted its intensification. Dry air can kill a hurricane and stop it in its tracks. For example, this happened to Hurricane Estelle back in 2022. Estelle was rapidly intensifying as it reached its peak strength of 85 miles per hour. However, dry air invaded its core and caused it to stop intensifying and resulted in the storm unraveling and dissipating a few days later. However, this was not the case for Dorian. As dry air invaded Dorian's core, it fought back. And it fought back hard because six hours later, it forced the dry air out of its core. This did take a toll on Dorian's development, however, and all day on August 29th, it did not strengthen, but it reorganized and consolidated the gains it made. By this point, however, Dorian was now expected to make landfall in the northern Bahamas, and then move towards Florida, where a landfall near Fort Lauderdale was anticipated. The NHC initially expected Dorian to make landfall on the Bahamas as a Category 3 hurricane before continuing to Florida as a low-end Category 4 hurricane. As such, these areas began preparing for Dorian's arrival. In the Bahamas, people in Great Abaco, Grand Bahama, and other islands in the chain began to board up homes, stock up on supplies such as food and water, with one video clip of people pouring water in 5-gallon bottles going viral. In Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis declared a state of emergency on August 28th for 26 counties, later expanding it to the entire state. With a potential landfall at Fort Lauderdale as a major hurricane, the state needed to take action. 4,500 National Guard members were deployed and residents began to board up homes and businesses as well as stock up on food and water in case an evacuation was ordered. By 5 p.m. August 29th, Dorian had consolidated its structure yet again and began to strengthen once again. This is when Dorian would undergo its second and largest rapid intensification cycle. Starting at 85 mile per hour, it would become an absolute beast by the next day. Hurricane Hunter reconnaissance aircraft was now flying into Dorian constantly, and what they found was not good at all. At around 9.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, it was reported that they found surface winds of 105 miles per hour in Dorian through drop sends and flight level winds. 30 minutes later, the NHC declared Dorian a Category 2 hurricane with winds of 105 miles per hour. Dorian did not stop, becoming a major hurricane by 2 p.m. on August 30th with hurricane warnings issued for much of the Bahamas, including Grand Bahama, Great Abaco, Eleuthera, where Hurricane Andrew made landfall in 1992, and Nassau, the capital of the Bahamas. But Dorian was not done. Dorian became a Category 4 hurricane at 8.30 p.m., with hurricane hunters finding winds of 130 miles per hour. 
Eventually, Dorian would strengthen into a 140 mile per hour category 4 hurricane, meaning that in 24 hours, Dorian went from a manageable category 1 hurricane into a monster category 4, something that neither the NHC or Bahamas expected, making the threat that much more dangerous to those in the latter. Hurricane warnings were issued and evacuations from Grand Bahama and Great Abaco began, as it was evident that Dorian was going to cause catastrophic damage to the islands. However, Dorian was once again halted in its strengthening, not by dry air, but its own structure. By this point, the eye had cleared and it was a near perfect structure and a near perfect circle as an eye. The optimal hurricane in the optimal conditions. However, the western eye wall was having a hard time. The convection in the area had eroded and the eye wall was threatened. This stopped Dorian's intensification and it soon began to consolidate once again, but the eye wall nearly broke in a couple of instances, with the distance between a, the weaker convection and the eye only a couple of miles in distance at some points. However, as the storm rotated counterclockwise, convection from the northern part of the storm reinforced it and prevented an eye wall collapse. By this point, Dorian was on an absolute roll and the Bahamas were now in its path. Dorian modestly strengthened all day on August 31st, reaching 150 miles per hour by 2 p.m. By this point, however, another thing that was changing, and this would make Dorian the catastrophic hurricane it was. The Bermuda High, a subtropical ridge that is well known for guiding hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin, started to weaken, and the NHC now had Dorian stalling in the Bahamas instead of continuing and making landfall in Florida. Dorian's forward speed slowed down from 12 miles per hour to 8 miles per hour by the afternoon of August 31st, and it now had more time over warm water, feeding it more energy and allowing it to strengthen more. Here is where the NHC got into some controversy, as the call on the next advisory was coming up. Hurricane hunters were investigating Dorian that night and found winds of Category 5 strength. The flight level winds began to indicate such strength around 9.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and the SFMR readings were indicative of that. According to Devin Williams, a meteorologist from the group known as Force 13, there was one SFMR reading of 155 knots, or around 180 miles per hour, and at least three SFMRs of 145 knots, or 165 miles per hour, and a drop send reading of 180 miles per hour. However, when the NHC issued their advisory, they kept the winds at 150 miles per hour, despite much evidence that it was stronger than that, with Williams suggesting that the winds were at least 165 miles per hour due to the reconnaissance readings. It is important to note here that this decision did not cause backlash from the general public, but it caused much backlash from the meteorology community as it seemed that the NHC was ignoring the evidence provided to them. The NHC believed that there wasn't enough evidence to suggest that a Category 5 hurricane was going on, but Williams responded with this. The they, don't like measured peak they don't like it because the flight level winds doesn't match the reductions. There's 150 knot flight level winds in the system. You usually reduct that to be from a knot reading to a mile an hour reading and then turn that back. So there's a hundred and there's a hundred and fifty knot. Uh, there's a one hundred and fifty knot flight level reading that would be indicative of a category five. You guys go ahead and say that Hurricane Matthew gets a hundred and thirty five <laughs> knot flight level winds and then you say that's a hundred and sixty five mile an hour? And you're saying this ain't a cat five? Even with this call, the result was the same. Dorian was about to hit the Bahamas, stall over the Northern Islands, bring hell to an area well known for tourism, and chew them up and spit them out. Dorian continued to move towards the Bahamas, now undergoing its third 
and most significant rapid intensification cycle, at 8 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on September 1st, the NHC finally upgraded Dorian to a Category 5 hurricane with winds of 160 miles per hour, as it was expected to make landfall in the next six hours. Tropical storm force winds had already arrived on the Bahamas, and with the convection in the outer area of the hurricane beginning to explode, Dorian was evidently continuing to grow in size. At 8.30 a.m., while the director of the NHC, Ken Graham, was talking with Weather Channel meteorologist Jim Cantori, he was handed a piece of paper that said that Dorian was actually 175 miles per hour instead of 160 miles per hour, both showing that this Titan had no signs of slowing down in intensity and that Force 13 and other members of the meteorology community were right about Dorian. Dorian's strength continued to grow, and with the eyewall now hitting Great Abaco, the storm surge of 23 feet began to obliterate everything in its path. Finally, at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on September 1st, 2019, Dorian made a historic landfall on Elbow Key with winds of 185 miles per hour and a pressure of 911 millibars, making it the strongest hurricane to make landfall on the Atlantic Basin and tied with the Labor Day hurricane in 1935, which unironically made landfall on the same weekend as Dorian for the strongest landfall in the Atlantic Ocean. Dorian then made landfall on Great Abaco, which was facing that of the equivalent of an EF4 tornado that was over 30 miles across, and with gusts of over 220 miles per hour, it was obvious that this would not just be catastrophic, but apocalyptic, with videos of residents in Marsh Harbor pleading to the Lord to help as the storm surge wiped out entire neighborhoods. Dorian had now slowed even further to 5 miles per hour, an effective crawl as it was moving slowly towards Grand Bahama and Freeport, where all hell was about to break loose. Dorian made landfall in Grand Bahama at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and Freeport was subject to two days of eyewall and rain of over 30 inches on top of the 23 feet of storm surge. However, the nightmare had just begun here, as Dorian stalled over Grand Bahama in the overnight hours of September 2nd, and it would slowly weaken due to upwelling of water feeding Dorian. However, an eyewall replacement cycle after many rapid intensification cycles, after it got to 185 miles per hour, it finally began to take place on the same day, September 2nd and it was weakening at a faster pace. Dorian did remain a Category 5 hurricane until 11 a.m. on September 2nd, attaining Category 5 status for 33 hours while making landfall in the Bahamas. Dorian continued to stall just north of Grand Bahama, and no one knew what it would do. Would it move north towards the Carolinas and parallel the East Coast like Matthew did before it? Or would it continue to the west, towards Florida, as a slightly weaker hurricane? The answer soon came, as the Bermuda High collapsed and allowed Dorian to move north late on September 3rd. Dorian had weakened significantly in this time. It was now only a Category 2 hurricane, but it still had a much bigger eye, and the convection that was used up in the Bahamas began to return, and Dorian reached Category 3 strength once again off the coast of Georgia on September 4th at 11 p.m., but it was the last time Dorian would reach such a peak. Dorian would move parallel to South Carolina, bringing hurricane force winds to parts of the state and would weaken down to a Category 1 hurricane before making landfall at Cape Hatteras in North Carolina on September 6th, a shell of its former self. Dorian would move much faster after this, bringing tropical storm force winds to Massachusetts before reinvigorating its dying self, becoming a Category 2 hurricane off the coast of Nova Scotia in Canada. However, Dorian's time was up, 
It had been declared a post-tropical cyclone before making its final landfall in Nova Scotia before being completely absorbed by another system. Its legacy was left behind with destruction and suffering for much of where it hit. The U.S. Virgin Islands were not hit as hard as they were with Hurricane Irma, but there were still major complications. The power went out for much of the island chain, and Puerto Rico suffered minor damage due to the tropical storm force winds. Overall, the damage was moderate in the Virgin Islands, but manageable, with only one death in Puerto Rico and approximately $20 million in damages. The same cannot be said for the Bahamas. Dorian's 185 mile per hour winds were apocalyptic to the islands, with entire settlements wiped off the map by storm surge and high winds. Great Abaco was obliterated by Dorian, with Marsh Harbor receiving the brunt of the damage, including its airport going underwater due to Dorian's massive storm surge. Marsh Harbor also recorded a pressure of 913.4 millibars, making it the lowest pressure recorded in the island's history. In Grand Bahama, the damage was arguably more apocalyptic, with Freeport getting in the eyewall for two days, destroying homes and well-built structures and infrastructure alike. Dorian did not discriminate when it came to destruction. Nearly every structure on Grand Bahama was damaged or destroyed. Dorian also brought rare birds only found on the Abaco Islands in Grand Bahama to near extinction as it stalled in the island for two days and destroyed their habitats. In total, 74 people were killed in the Bahamas, with 245 missing still to this day. But it is presumed that they have died, as it is possible that the bodies were washed out to sea by the insane storm surge. The damage was at $3.4 billion, making it the costliest hurricane in the Bahamas, by far. Dorian will remain in the mines for many people in the Bahamas as it stalled for two days as a Category 5 hurricane, which is one of the reasons it makes it hist historic as mentioned in this documentary. But Hurricane Dorian has passed. Unfortunately, it was only the prelude to something much larger in 2020. But that is a documentary for another time. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. Also, be sure to subscribe to Force 13 as they provide amazing hurricane coverage. I recommend you ch uh, you check them out and subscribe to the channel uh, with them. I hope you enjoy the documentary. I hope you got something from this as well. And if you would like to request a documentary, please be free to do that in the comments down below. But with that being said, have a wonderful day. Stay safe.